In the last book in the New Testament, the Apostle John was taken to a place um, that can only be understood as the presence of God. He was on the Isle of Patmos, but he just got to have an extra special time and being with the Lord and showing him things to come, things to come. And in the last chapter of Revelation, the next to last verse, the Bible says this, he who testifies to these things says, now that's Jesus, Jesus said, surely I am coming quickly. Quickly, he said. Amen. It is true. Even so come Lord Jesus. Are y'all looking forward to Christ coming back? Does it seem like it's going to come quick? No? Would you like for it to come a little bit more quick? Quickly? Well, he's coming quick. It's all a matter of timing. Paul said in Romans chapter 13, verse 11, and do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awaken out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Anybody realize we're a little bit closer to home? Anybody feel a little closer to home? You know, I, I heard it said about Enoch that he walked with God. And they, they, they described it kind of like this. They said, one day Enoch and God were walking together and um, the Lord looked over at him and said, Enoch, we're closer to my house than we are your house. Why don't we just go on home together? That's the way it's going to be for all of us. But in the meantime, there's some things we needed to be doing. Paul said there in Romans, it's high time to waken out of sleep for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. As we walk into the most precious time of the year, when we look and celebrate our Lord's going to Jerusalem to pay that ransom for our sinful souls on Calvary and to give us eternal life through the empty tomb, His resurrection, there's some things that we need to look at and understand and be very grateful for. So I want us to talk about and examine our salvation in the next few weeks. There's one thing that uh, all of us Christians have in common. <clears throat> We're not in a hurry down here. Y'all have some things y'all want to get done? Seems like every day it just goes by so quickly. And I don't know about some of you, but uh, my days have sped up. The more days I spend down here, the faster they go. And I've faced some things where I want to look at my time here and I want to use the most uh, for my time. There's some prayers that I've been praying for a lot of years that I haven't seen fulfilled yet, and I'd like to see them fulfilled. What about you? There's some things I'd like to see us do, but seems like we not always in a hurry, and sometimes I think we've misplaced as Christians our urgency. Should we be urgent to walk with the Lord and get some things accomplished while we're still here? Y'all look up here. If you're looking at me, your mission's not done. If your mission were done, you wouldn't be looking at me. You'd be looking at Jesus face to face. Long as you're here, there's some things that need to get accomplished in Jesus' name. And, and because we're not in a hurry, we've lost our urgency, and we may need to uh, examine our salvation and our witness and make sure that we're not lethargic in our witness. One thing all Christians should have in common is a desire every day to surrender, ship, surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Would you agree? We need to take up our cross daily. We need to get out on our, on our on our faces before Him, and every day we need to make sure that He is Lord of our personal lives. Paul said it well in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. He said, redeeming the time because the days are evil. He also said it to the church at Colossae. He said, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. We better take value 
of the time that God's given us. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter, that great apostle, in the, the, the very last chapter that he would write, said, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. There's some things that we need to remember. So as we look through this portion of Scripture today, it is my prayer that God would remind us as Christians of some of the things that God would have us to do. As a matter of fact, if it's all right with you, let's just pause and ask God for that right now. Let's pray. Father, I pray this be your moment. Pray it be a holy moment. It's your holy word, your Holy Spirit. For those that are here today that we are your children, we know that you are there for us, that you walk with us, that you whisper, that you guide, that you love and you lead. And we are so grateful for that. But Lord, if you're loving, and if you're leading, may we be listening. May we not be apathetic. May we stir up our hearts to love you and to follow you. And, oh Lord, remind us today that we should be redeeming the time because the days are evil around us. And Lord, I don't know when you're coming. You say you're coming quickly. Some say you're not coming at all. Lord, speak, for your children are listening. And Lord, if there is someone here that has been putting off that day of salvation, they have taken what you did on the cross lightly, something maybe they, they think about sometimes, but it's not leading their life in Jesus. You're not fully Lord. I pray that today that person will make the decision to give their heart and life to you before it's everlastingly too late. Father, speak as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Verse 2 in 2 Peter 3 says, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. That's what I want you to see today. Be mindful of these words and of the commandments of us, the apostles and those who were there in the early days of the church, the apostles of our Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, the word knowing there means to be in full perception of, to understand and, and to perceive, to come to know. They have come to know in their life that there will be scoffers that will come in the last days. A lot of people say that we are living in the last days. Well, truly there are scoffers. There are people who are mockers. There are people that are laughing at Christians. There are people that are laughing at Christianity. There are people that are saying, oh, Jesus was just a, a, a normal Jew who wanted to, to bring a revolt and Rome killed him for his efforts. God help us. He was more than that. And if you believe that he was the Son of God who came to bring us life and that we might have that life abundantly and clear and free, then we understand that we are blessed and we don't want to follow those false leaders at all. As a matter of fact, Jesus' half-brother on this world, his name was Jude. He said this in Jude 16, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. Have y'all heard any grumblers and complainers in the world? following their own desires, their own logic, their own wisdom. They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But he says, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ and how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own lusts, their own desires, their own 
thinking. Don't be surprised by this. Don't be persuaded by this. There's always going to be mockers out there. It's been almost 2,000 years. And there's still mockers. The disciples thought then that Christ might return in their lifetime. But He hasn't yet. But that doesn't mean that God, His imminent return, is not coming. You know, these mockers, they're always convinced and they love their own opinion and they, they love to hear each other as, as they get together and they make fun of and they seek to influence other. The world's full of mockers. It says in verse 4 that, that they, they, they make these words. He said, um, <clears throat> where is the promise of His coming? Where is this proof of that He's coming again. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. God created the world. He gave life. Adam and Eve started having children. People live. People die. People are born. They live and they die. The sun comes up. The sun sets another day. Another generation, another decade, another millennial. Where's the promise that God made that He is the King of all the world? Where is the promise of this heaven? Where is the promise that God, the Creator of all, will sustain us and keep us forever? Where's the proof? Of this, verse 5 says, For this they willingly forget. That's how it says it in the New King James. They, they, they willfully forget. The <clears throat> Old King James says, they, um, For this they uh, willfully are ignorant of. They, CSB, the Christian Standard, says they deliberately overlook. The NIV says they deliberately forget the NET says that they deliberately suppress the fact. The Revised Standard Version says they deliberately ignore. Darby's Version says hidden from them through their own willfulness. The Basic Bible Edition says, but in taking this view, they put out of their minds the memory. He says they willfully forget that by the Word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and into the water, and by which the worlds that then existed perished, being flooded by water. But Peter says, let's go back to the beginning. Where is the proof? Well, the proof is first in creation. When God the Father had a desire for the world and Jesus spoke, and when Jesus spoke, let there be, the Holy Spirit, the power of God, took those words and made it alive. The Word of God spoke and the power of God made those things alive and nothing has taken away from that Word. Nothing is taken away from that promise. We're still living in the midst of that promise. We forget about that, but we're here. And by the way, the sun in this little galaxy that we have, there's plenty of galaxies out there, billions of galaxies, they say. In our own little galaxies, there are billions of planets. We've got this one little planet out there that we call the sun, and, and these little, many little planets that kind of keep going around the sun, I mean, we're going just the way God ordered it, right? We're spinning exactly right. Not too fast, not too slow. We're not getting too close and getting burned up. We're not <laughs> getting too far away and skipping off out there in the galaxy. I mean, it's perfectly in His hand. How many of y'all like spring? How many of you thought the buds would come? Was I the only one? I was expecting because when the seasons happen and you know, have y'all ever seen peaches before? I got peach trees. 
And you know what happened? I got buds and blooms on my peach trees. Guess what's going to happen? Peaches are going to come. Because God put it in place and everything is the same as it has been. The sovereign God of the universe is in control. You might willfully forget that. You might take that for granted, but that doesn't make it not true. But he says there's another example. He says there's the example of a time when God was disturbed and let there be a flood. If you have your Bible, over, keep your finger in Peter, but look over in uh, Genesis chapter number 6. If I can turn my page. Look in Genesis 6 verse number 3. The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. For he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 100, 120 years. My spirit shall not strive with man forever. How many of you felt the Spirit of God strive in your life? Anybody felt the convicting power of the Holy Spirit? Anybody felt the drawing power of the Holy Spirit? Anybody heard the Lord call your name, tell you that you're loved, that you're cherished, that you're important, showing you your sin, telling you that if you would be willing to turn from your sin, change your mind about that way, that, that, that way of desire, that way of lust, the Bible calls it, and change that, repent of it, that God would be there for you and cleanse you and forgive you and save you anybody ever felt that anybody got a testimony today it can god good but you know sometimes people say no isn't that sad sometimes when the spirit says yes they say no he says i'm not always strive y'all look up here what an absolute blessing to have God call your name. Do you know how honored you should feel that the Holy Spirit would call you to himself? That Jesus would die on the cross of Calvary for you? That he would apply his blood and that your sin will be separated as far as the east is from the west? Though your sin like crimson will be made, what? White. Say it good and loud. They can hear you online. White. White as snow. Praise God. Do you feel special? Do you feel loved? God loves you with an everlasting love. But you know, some people, they say no to that. Not now. Not now. Maybe later. Not now. I don't want to do that. Trust me. God's Spirit will not always strive. So he says in verse number 5, Genesis 6, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that the intent of their thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God help us. God forgive me because so many times my own heart, my own saved redeemed, forgiven heart, still follows its own desires. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. He was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and the birds of the air, for I am sorry. I regret the fact that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Anybody grateful for grace? So God said, I have a plan. Let me, can I condense this? Can I tell the story quickly? You see, Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. And I said, I'm going to tell the story quickly. And it seems like Jesus is never going to get through. And it's going to seem like my stories never get through. Amen? 
quickly is a matter of personal perception, I guess. God came to Noah and said, Noah, my heart hurts for these people. I look at them and I love them, but they turn their back and they, they follow their own desires. They're doing things that, that I don't want to look at. I, don't, I didn't make them for this. Ungodly things, immoral things, hurtful things. If they feel it, if they want it, they do it. Where's their love? Where's their allegiance? All they want to do is wickedness. Noah, I'm tired. Matter of fact, I regret. So I'm going to start over. Noah, I want you to build a boat. Lord, what's a boat? It's this thing that I'm going to give you the dimensions for, and I, I want you to build it. And, and you and your boys and their wives, you and your wife, believers in me, keep believing. Keep trusting. Though it doesn't make sense, I promise you I'm going to judge the world. You're going to judge the world? Yes, I'm going to judge. I'm going to bring the judgment of rain. Lord, what's rain? To this point, it had never rained on the earth. The skies were like an inverted umbrella, upside down, holding the moistures in the air. Have you ever seen a terrarium? It's covered up, but in a terrarium, the, the moisture will come up and it will, it will bring the watering of the earth. It had never rained to that point in time, but God said, I'm going to rip the sky apart and water is going to fall from the heavens it is called rain. It's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm going to open up the floodgates and this world will be covered with waters. But this boat will protect you and I will keep you from the rain and from the floods and from the storms and from the death that will occur. Now Noah, oh I love this. 1 Peter, when he went, excuse me, 2 Peter, and, and, and let me just read this to you. He, it, it says in, in verse number 6 that, that he said he did not spare the ancient world, verse 5, but saved Noah, one of eight people, and he calls him a preacher of righteousness. Noah was a preacher. Can I get an amen for the preacher? Of righteousness, a herald. That meant for 120 years he built a boat. But people come up to him and say, Noah, what in the world are you doing? I'm building a boat. Why are you building a boat? God said he's going to judge the earth. Why is he going to judge the earth? Because you're wicked. You're not following him. Well, what's he going to do? He's going to send rain. What's rain? It's water from heaven. I've never seen that. Well, I hadn't either. But he says it's coming. He promised. Oh, Noah, you're a fool. And he kept building. And he kept preaching, and he kept building, and he kept preaching. Five years, people said, Noah, you still building? Ten years, 20 years, 50 years, he's still building. Noah, haven't you given up on that word from God yet? You still believe God's going to judge? Yes, I do. 75 years, 100 years, 120 years, God said, hey, Noah, it's time. You know that boat? I'm bringing the animals. Noah didn't have to round up one. God brought them. And under the, see, the animals would do what we won't do. When God spoke to them, they obeyed. And God protected. Noah and his family, God spoke and they obeyed and they got in the boat and God protected. But when they all got in the boat, listen now, God closed the door. Noah didn't close the door. God closed the door. And those that were in the boat were safe. And those that scoffed, listen, those that mocked, those that laughed, 
Those that said, I've never heard of such. Where's the promise of it? When the rain started coming. What in the world is that? Well, I think it's water from heaven. Hey, that old preacher, Noah, what was it that he called that water from heaven? Rain. Could this be it? No. God doesn't judge. God's a God of love. He would never let us be punished. I wonder how they felt when it rained a little harder. I wonder how they felt when it got up to their ankles. I wonder how it was when people started running and knocking on the door of the ark and saying, Noah, now we believe. Open up the door, let us in. But Noah didn't lock the door, and he didn't have the key to open it. Only God could do that. It got knee high, waist high, and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. By the way, all the civilizations all over the world have in their history the words of the flood. Even in America, the Native Americans and all the stuff that we found of them, they have the stories of the great flood that covered the earth. Even scientists today, they don't understand it. They can't explain it. They try to explain things away that they don't understand. They try to come up with this theory and that theory, but they said it seems that the evidence shows there was such a flood. He said they're knowingly ignorant, but ignorant because they don't remember that God judged. So let's look at what God's Word said. Verse 7 says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same Word, the Word of God that keeps the creation going, that, that holds us, that gives us oxygen, that gives us the sun, that gives us warmth, that gives us food, the same God who's in control of that, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. All the scientists who don't understand, they said, look, look, this world, it began with a big bang. No, it didn't. It began with the Word of God, but it's going to end with a big bang. Look what it says here. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Look in verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. You won't expect him. In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. It will disappear. It will go away. But don't worry. Don't fret. Because Revelation says that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. And by the way, that word new is the word where we get not refurbished, but brand spanking new. Do you all know what I mean? <clears throat> when? Well, don't you realize that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years? thousand years is one day. Listen to this next part. The Lord is not slow, slack, the old King James says. He's not slow concerning His promise. You, you may say He's not coming quick. He's coming slow. Where's the promise? We haven't seen it yet. I haven't heard the trumpet. When's He coming? He's not slow as some count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. Church, listen to me. <clears throat> I hope you hear it well. I hope you hear it good. Gerald, well, I know it's 12 o'clock or 11 o'clock, but we'll be through in a few minutes, okay? Go ahead and blow your nose, Gerald. 
Thank you for coming. He says to these people, he said, he's not slow, but, but just to understand this, he's long-suffering. Now, there's a difference between the word patient and the word long-suffering. We need patience, but patience deals with circumstances. Y'all have to go through circumstances. Long-suffering deals with people. Suffer long. Have y'all ever had to suffer dealing with people? Be caring and waiting and gentle and kind? Sometimes we have to go through circumstances and that heavy weight's on our shoulders and we, we just have to remain under the weight. But sometimes we just need to suffer along with people. And oh my goodness, hasn't God had to suffer with us? Aren't you grateful that He's full of grace? Aren't you grateful that He's merciful and kind? Aren't you grateful that the, that the works of the Holy Spirit bring joy? Come on now. And peace. No matter the rest, no matter all that other junk. Folks, there's always going to be junk until Jesus returns. But we get the privilege of being encompassed in His love. Just understand that sometimes God will be slow if He needs to be slow. How many of y'all have had a second chance? Anybody had a third chance? Look, at, in all of eternity, God is the omnipresent God. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Please understand this. He's not nervous by time like we are. We look at the watch and we're say, we look at the calendar. We look at the gray hair in our head and we say, the, the time is slipping away. There's so much that needs to be done. Church, we need to wake up every day and be faithful to the Lord. Bow before Him as Lord. <clears throat> because we don't know when we'll see Him. We don't know when He'll come back. He'll come back like a thief. Quick, unexpected. And today is the day of salvation. Today is the time that we need to Give our heart and life to Him. It's coming to an end. If you've had a second chance, praise God. If you've had a 222nd chance, praise God. But just understand this, there will be a time that God will say, enough. I heard it said one time. I've thought a lot about this. The Bible's to go to everyone in the world. The Word of God is to go to everyone in the world. I heard a man say, he said, wouldn't it be great if everyone could hear? But some hear it over and over and over and over and over again, and they're not concerned about the one who's never heard it once. But what about the one who's heard it over and over and over and over and over again, but yet continues to say, not yet, not now. Spoke to someone this week. Asked him if he goes to church. He said, uh, not yet. So my wife keeps getting on me. He, we talked a little bit about that. I didn't tell him, but I, I, I was thinking, praise God for a wife that keeps on her husband lovingly, kindly, gently, prayerfully, not giving up on him. I said, where does she go to church? And he told me. I said, I go to New Holland. I said, the preacher's not too good, but the people are great. <laughs> you know, I'm praying for him that he'll come before it's everlastingly too late. See, because we think that we have time. But how many of you know time keeps ticking away? Time keeps moving. Time keeps going by, and we're missing out on time. I'm grateful for eternal life, y'all. I'm grateful when we get to heaven and it's full of greatness and joy and peace and love and all that, that I don't have to leave. <clears throat> I, I, I see the, 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 the things that go on in this world, and I say, oh, God, why, 
Why do we have to continue through this? Why do we have to continue on? Well, God's patient, long-suffering, and kind. He says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, verse 12, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with fervor and heat. He, nevertheless, we, according to His promise, He promised, look for a new heaven, new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these ting, things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, <clears throat> without spot, blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Why is it taking so long? Because He doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Verse 9. Let me say this again. He doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. <clears throat> this is Brian's understanding. The Bible tells us that even Jesus doesn't know the day or the time. Why wouldn't he know? The Father knows. And Jesus has got another job to do right now. He's on the throne in heaven the right hand of the Father. He hears your thoughts. He knows your heart. He's praying for you. He's calling. The Spirit's calling your name. He wants you to come to salvation. And praise God, all over the world today, people have bowed their heart before Him. They have repented of their sins. They've cried out to God and they've asked Him to save Him. And Jesus says, yes, I'll save you. He takes the pen and writes their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And it goes on. The sun never sets. The work of salvation never ends. And God continues on until one day the Father will say, that's the one. That's the one I was looking for. That's the last one to pray the prayer. The book is full. Now Jesus, go get them. Gabriel will wet his lips. <laughs> Just say when. And when he blows that trumpet, the whole world's going to hear it. Amen. And the Lord will come in the clouds and call us. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And if he comes today and I'm still here, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. The word snatched up. Y'all like that? It's like he comes and says, my church, my people, I know who you are. Separate the sheep from the goats. Bam, come on home. And we'll get to come home. And all hell will break loose on earth. The great tribulation. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of choice. Today is the day of opportunity. It's up to you. Salvation is full and free. And it is forever. Please don't sin away your day of grace. We make choices every day. God is the God of foreknowledge. He understands decisions before they're made. Because He's a God who's not limited by time. When He told Noah, to build the boat, he gave him dimensions because he knew that group of people would reject salvation. And he knew that Noah and his family would receive the election of salvation. But that doesn't mean that he didn't give them the choice. He just lets them live with the consequences. The foreknowledge of God is here. He knows the ones that are in the book. And when the last name's been written down, he'll say, that's my people. Go get them. Do you want to be a part of that? If there's anyone here today that has not given their heart and life, their sin, their soul, their being, their dreams, their everything under Christ, is today your day of salvation? <clears throat>